Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're starting a new sermon series this week, and it's going to be based on the Lord's Prayer. Um, I don't know if you remember a while back we went through the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters uh, 5 through 7. And uh, in, embedded in there is the Lord's Prayer, the, the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. And it was during that time that we decided that during our prayer time here at the church that we were going to start saying the Lord's Prayer because it kind of seems like a good idea, right? If Jesus says, pray like this, that we would go ahead and do that. And so we've been doing that, which is great. But, you know, it can kind of become rote sometimes, right? A little bit robotic because we've got it memorized and we just say it, but we don't think about what we're saying. We don't meditate on the words that we're saying. Just like sometimes if you're like me, the songs, like as a musician, I listen to the music portion of it so much that if you ask me, so what was that song about? I'd be like, I, I, I don't know. I like the way it sounds, you know, like, like we just have to be mindful of some of these things. And so I think that's true with the Lord's Prayer as well because this is what Jesus taught us to pray. And so we're, in the weeks to come, going to be breaking it down line by line so that we can actually appreciate the words that we're speaking here, that we can say them from the heart, uh, that it comes from a place of conviction and passion for us, and maybe becomes a pattern of prayer in our individual lives as well. So that's what we'll be looking at in the weeks to come. Um, but switching gears here a little bit, I have to tell you something. I've never been a golfer, ever. In my life, okay? I mean, mini golf, I'll take you on in a game of mini golf any day. Uh, but actually being on a real golf course, I've never done it before. It's kind of crazy. After 40 years, you'd think at one point you'd be out there. Uh, but the closest that I've come is going to Great Shots, you know, which is kind of like that glorified uh, driving range that we have here in Sioux Falls. And it was so fun, the times that I've been there. Like, you go there with friends and people that you love. And I just remember, like, how exciting it was the first time to be, like, standing on deck out there. And you're ready to swing with this thing. And you're just like, whoosh, you know. And then I'm, like, looking, like, where did it go? It must be, like, way out there. And then I realize, oh, I didn't even hit it. <laughs> it's still there, right? You know, but, like, that's okay. I'll try again. Try again. And then swing and a miss. Try again. Swing and a miss. Like, and I'm thinking, man, this is a lot harder than I thought this was going to be. And so, like, you finally get one good one in, and you, and you hit it, right? But then that's what it sounds like, too. <laughs> but it just hits the top of the ball. Have you ever done this before? And it, like, kind of rolls forward. It's super unsatisfying. Like, and then you finally get one where you, like, really connect with it. And, like, that is a great feeling, right? But the time that I did that the first time, it just slices, like, way over, like, no control. It's so hard. Like, I, I respect what these professionals do so much. But, you know, like, after you do it for a little while and your friends sit there and they watch you hacking away at it and they've, like, maybe been playing golf a little bit more, they're like, well, first off, dude, um, you're using a putter, okay? <laughs> and I'm like, well, I come from the world of mini golf. This is all I know, right? It's not that bad, okay? I've got, like, I use an actual driver. But, and then they're also like, also don't hold it like this, you know? Like, kind of hold it like this. And like, oh, okay. Again, I'm not that dumb. I didn't do that. But, you know, the weird thing is, like, just, like, your stance and how you do it. And, like, it just feels awkward, right? And, like, even the whole thing that's really hard for me is, like, having your arm, like, straight. That just feels so weird because you just want to hack at it like Happy Gilmore if you've ever seen that. Like, that's how I want to play. And here's the thing with golf is that it doesn't matter if you're not great at it. Anybody can play golf. Anybody can swing the club and hit the ball, and you'll probably have a really good time doing it. But if you have somebody that you're playing with that's mastered the game of golf and understands a thing or two, if they come in and they give you some pointers and they teach you how to play the game, you might be able to enjoy the game in the fullness of what you could be enjoying when you play it. And I think that there's something similar about that with prayer in our lives, too. Because anyone can pray, right? You've probably heard people say before, and it's true, that prayer is just conversation with God. Amen. Absolutely. Like, God just wants us to come to him. He wants us to, to share our hearts with him. But, you know, sometimes kind of like golf, too, if we're only doing it on our own terms, uh, we might be missing out on the fullness of what God intends for us to understand from it, too. And so it's helpful to have a master that can teach us how to pray. 
And you know, Jesus is a really good master. Like, he understood how to pray so well. And his disciples knew this, too. They'd see him go off, and they'd go off, he'd go off into the wilderness and be gone for long, long, long periods of time. And so at one point, they're like, hey, Jesus, uh, do you think you could teach us to pray as well, like the way that John the Baptist taught his disciples to pray? And Jesus says, yeah, I can do that. And so when you pray, pray like this. And so when God in the flesh comes to us and says, come follow us and says, oh, and by the way, when you pray, pray like this, like we should be paying close attention, right? Because it's possible that, you know, like if we're praying in our own lives, like we, we pray and it's genuine and God hears it and he cares. But, but sometimes we end up just praying for the things that like, this is all I know. This is all I think about. But then the master steps in and he teaches us to, to broaden our view. Okay, because what do we do when we pray? We pray for the things that matter to us, right? I hope my sports team wins. I, I hope that my aunt can get through the surgery that she's going through. I, I'm praying for this diagnosis that I'm waiting for. Like, and these are important things, you know, like they matter to our hearts. And, and, it, and God cares about it, right? Um, but Jesus broadens our prayer life, too. I heard somebody say one time that the purpose of prayer is not to get God to do what we want him to do, but the purpose of prayer is to be properly formed. See, we pray about the things that we care about, but sometimes Jesus is saying, you don't pray about these things, but I'm going to teach you to pray about them because they matter, and you can learn to care about this stuff. And that's what the Lord's Prayer does with us when we go through it. So we're going to start taking a look at it just line by line. From Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, and Jesus says this, This, then, is how you should pray, our Father in heaven. We're going to stop there for today. Um, now, when we do uh, the prayer on Sundays, we, we, we chose, we, we talked about it in the staff meeting, how we're going to do this, and we kind of went the traditional King James language, okay? So maybe you're used to our Father who art in heaven, you know, like what's the art thing? Like don't worry, it's just old English language for like um, our Father who is in heaven or, or our Father in heaven. So uh, the King James language might seem a little bit traditional, uh, but maybe it causes us to reflect more on what we're saying because it seems a little strange. But let's just start with the very first word, okay? Our. Now I think that's important because notice it doesn't start with me and my and I, like it's individual language as we often do with our prayer life. It's like already through the whole thing, it, it's our and us and we. And so the context of this prayer that Jesus is giving us is community. It's like, I'm not just praying for myself. I am doing that. That's for certain. But I'm also broadening my vision and praying for our witness as Christians in the world, as the church. Like, God, would you sustain us? Would you help us to be healthy so that we can be your faithful representatives in this world and bring glory to your name? Like, it's a prayer outside of just myself. And again, that's like the golf swing thing. Like, it feels awkward, right? Right? Like, we want to just pray for ourselves. Uh, but Jesus is already teaching us to broaden our perspective and to start to see other people, right? So that, that's going to follow us through the whole prayer. But today, what I really want to focus in on is the Father. Who is this Father that we're praying to? And I think being clear about this is really, really important, okay? Because we're talking about the character of the Father, uh, and, you know, this, this really has a, a huge impact on our spiritual lives, uh, about the nature of our relationship with God. Because, uh, you know, for some of us, like, Father has been a really good thing. Like, I have a really, really good dad, Randy Fredricks, and I don't think, is, is Dad even in here? They might be in the nursery right now. But, uh, oh, there he is right there. Hey, Dad, back there. Yes, see what a good dad he is? He's helping out in the nursery. Um, and I just think that that's, that's a wonderful thing. That's a picture of who God, God is. He's a good father. But some of us have not had great fathers in our lives. And so that father language can be troubling. It, it's not helpful to us all of the time. Um, and then sometimes, too, I think we have these views about God the Father that he's kind of scary. He's like the great and powerful Oz and the Wizard of Oz and the flames shooting up and silence. What are you doing in my presence, you know? And they come before him and they're just like shaking uh, because he can be kind of scary sometimes. And, and sometimes like that's not totally unfounded. Like when we read through our own scriptures, we can see portraits of God that's like, whoa, he's like that. 
Like I've been reading through Jeremiah in my own time recently, and, and there's so many things in Jeremiah that are just beautiful. I'm so glad that it's there. And then honestly, there's some things that happen in Jeremiah that are like really troubling to me. Like there's, uh, to give just a little bit of context, okay, um, the Israelites had just been going astray as they so often do. These are God's chosen people. Uh, but they're, instead of just worshiping God like he brought them out of Egypt, he's done so many good things for them. If they would just listen to him, they would have life. But instead, they start looking to other nations. And they start worshiping their gods, and it just mixes things to the point where it gets so twisted, their identity, that they're like sacrificing their own children to these foreign gods, to these idols. And, and God has finally gotten to the point where he's just tired of it. And it's almost like if you're a parent and you're at wit's end and you just like lose your cool, like it kind of seems like that's almost what's going on here with God. Like he's throwing a bit of a temper tantrum here because just, I mean, just listen to some of this, okay? This is Jeremiah 13. God says, I will smash them against each other, even parents against children, says the Lord. I will not let my pity or mercy or compassion keep me from destroying them. Whew, that'll get your attention. But it goes on. 16, for this is what the Lord says about the children born here in the city and about their mothers and fathers. They will die from terrible diseases. No one will mourn for them or bury them, and they will lie scattered on the ground like manure. They will die from war and famine, and their bodies will be food for the vultures and wild animals. It gets worse. Here's another one. I will see to it that your enemies, remember he's talking to his own people here, that your enemies lay siege to the city until all the food is gone, then those trapped inside will eat their own sons and daughters and friends. They will be driven to utter despair. I mean, that's violent. That's offensive to hear that kind of stuff about anything, you know. But so when Jesus teaches us to pray, our Father in heaven, is he telling us to go into the presence of that kind of a Father? And if so... How do you stand before somebody like that? Now, I don't know about you, but I, I'd kind of keep my distance there, right? And just think to myself, you know, like my problems, it's really not that big a deal. I'm just going to like, he doesn't have to worry about me. Or, or even if I did get to a place where I felt like, no, I really do need to bring this into the throne room before God. God, please, w would you listen to me? I'd still be very tentative and, and just like the Wizard of Oz, you know, like shaking in my boots right there before him. Because God can seem unapproachable. And sometimes it's maybe hard to feel like, how do we relate to a God that's like this? How can I bring my stuff with him? When, when I, he's kind of intense. I'm not even really sure if I can have a warm relationship with him. But when Jesus enters the biblical narrative, he changes everything, including our understanding of the character of our Heavenly Father. Because before Jesus entered the scene, uh, we didn't know fully what God was like, all right? It was like we had this blurry vision of him, like, like we saw him in shadows before. But then when God reveals himself in Jesus Christ, it's like clear as day. All the light is shown. We can see perfect in, in HD, 1080, whatever the highest resolution is these days, 5K or whatever it is. Uh, and we see him clearly. We see his face, not just his shadow, the Father in all of his glory. And there's plenty of passages in the New Testament that make this very clear to us. But I want to focus on one in particular, because these are the words of Jesus. And I want us to notice the Father language that he uses here, too. This comes from John uh, chapter 14, verses 6 through 9. Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and, and he says, I am the way and the truth and the life, just like we sang. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you had really known me, you would know who my father is. From now on, you do know him, and you've seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the father, and we'll be satisfied. I mean, Philip's probably used to reading Jeremiah and some of that stuff, and he's like, come on, like, show us who the father really is. When the father's standing right before him, they like, don't even recognize him, because it's just like, no, it's not like that. It's more like what Jeremiah had to say, right? It's like... 
Jesus is a totally different picture, but Jesus goes on and says, Have you been with me all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. In other words, you want to see what God the Father is like? You're looking at him. That's, that's what Jesus is saying here. That's the effect of it. And so when Jesus, us to, Jesus teaches us to pray to our Father in heaven, he's inviting us to offer up our prayers to a very Jesus-like Father. This is the true character of God. God is Christ-like. And Jesus not only understands our, our understanding and clarifies our understanding of who God the Father is, but he also redefines our understanding of power. Because there's this line in there that says, Our Father in heaven. That, that's kind of like a descriptive thing. Like This is the realm that God dwells in. It's like his throne. And it's over the whole creation. It's over the entire cosmos. Like We could say that like in the United States, uh, the, in the Oval Office of the White House, whoever sits in that chair there is arguably in one of the most powerful positions in the whole world. But you know what? That pales in comparison to the God who sits on his throne in heaven over the whole, not only the United States, but the whole world, over the whole universe, over the whole creation, over time, over everything, over eternity. He sits in that position of authority. And it's almost like quantum mechanics. Like when you start talking those magnificent kind of like degrees of reality, like the physics change. Things are different, right? Uh, and that happens too. Like our understanding of power, that kind of power changes. And we see that this is a very humble kind of power that we don't expect. And we're going back to our Philippians passage. That famous one in Philippians chapter 2, 6 through 11. Though Jesus was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to, as something to exploit, as something to, to use for his own purposes. I've got all this power, what am I going to do with it? Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess and declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So what we see in Jesus is that our Father in heaven, he doesn't take this power over stance. He's not the great and powerful Oz with the flames shooting up and trying to scare everybody. But he kneels down into this world. I mean, this is what Paul's saying. If this is what's true about what Paul's saying, that he comes into the world like this to be with us. His arms outstretched. And you know what's awesome about this posture that God takes, his most powerful posture that he could take? This is a warm, inviting posture. You know? Like, have you ever seen the cheesy Hallmark movies where, like, the family's coming home for Christmas, the kids haven't seen Grandma and Grandpa for a long time, and the door flings open, and the grandparents come in, and they go like this? What happens? All the kids come running toward them. Because that's just an invitation of, I love you. Like, I welcome you. I want you to come and to be here in my presence. Even my dog, Leo, understands this. Like, I come home, and as soon, it doesn't matter what he's doing. When I get down like this, he's just bolting toward me and jumping into my lap. There's something about that posture that God takes in the world, that Paul testifies to, that draws us in, right? And you just think about the gospel stories, too. Think about the way that Jesus interacted with children. Like, the, the thing with children is that, like, in that culture then, like, they, they didn't matter. They just weren't really important. Like, maybe today what we see is, like, you know, during Thanksgiving there's always the kid table. Like, and they're supposed to sit there because this is the adult table. 
This is where the like, really important conversations happen. And Jesus could have been living that way in the world too. He could have been running with the upper echelon of society with the most important, dignified people up there, and they would have gladly welcomed him in. But what did Jesus do? He spent time with the kids. And when the people are trying to have their kids blessed and the kids are coming to him and the disciples are saying, get out of here. He's going, no, let him come to me. Like if Jesus was here today, he wouldn't be in here with us listening to a boring sermon. He'd be in Kids Serve. Or he'd be there in the nursery enjoying himself, right? Like this is the kind of God that we worship. I love if you've seen um, The Chosen. There's the episode where um, they show Jesus with the children. It just gets me every time because they just did it so beautifully, and I think they nailed it. Like the way that Jesus interacted with kids. Like he'd joke around with them. He, he like met them where they are, and he, he, taught, he like spoke their language, and he played their games with them. He played with their toys with them. And, you know, it, it was just like away from everything else. It was out of the spotlight, you know. Um, it was in their kind of like secret little place where they were playing on the outskirts of town. Um, and he just, he walked around and he taught them, like, that's such a beautiful picture of what the Father is like. And speaking of that, Jesus wanted us to understand the character of the Father. And I think that's why he gives us this beautiful story of the prodigal son. We all know this story, right? Uh, and th there's like the, the two sons on the opposite ends of the spectrum. The, the scumbag son who just only thinks about himself and he just like squanders all of his dad's wealth and his money and he's spoiled and he goes out and he uses it on horrible things that ruin his life. And then he returns back to his father and we know the story about the father. He doesn't have the gate locked. He's not asking him to beg to come back in. He goes running out to him because he loves his son. That kind of father, that's what God is like. And even with the kind of Pharisee-type older brother who's just like, I've been slaving out here in the fields for you, and then you welcome that guy back, the father even welcomes him in too. He's like, hey, I love you. Everything that I have is yours. He's just such a good father. And we see this in the way that Jesus interacted with so many other people in the Gospels. Like, it's just like tax collectors, prostitutes, notorious sinners, uh, unclean people according to the, the law, people who had been, uh, you know, like leprous or dead bodies touching them. You're not supposed to touch that. You're not supposed to interact with demon-possessed people. That makes you unclean. But guess what? Jesus had this posture with them. And they wanted to come and to be part of it. They welcomed him in, and he said, you come follow me, and I'm going to teach you how to take this posture in the rest of the world, and we're going to take over the world this way. I'm going to send you out as my kingdom people. And then, as if that's not enough, humanity does his absolute worst to God. God takes on flesh, enters into the world, we crucify him. And what's his posture? Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And then he raises back to life. And you'd think that he'd say, you know, forget it. I gave you so many chances and that's what you did to me? Instead, we see him with Peter, like, restoring him. Peter's, like, probably so full of shame after he had denied knowing Jesus the three times. And, and Jesus just takes him in and he's like, hey, Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. He does that three times, just like restores Peter, brings him back to life. And, and that's what he does to all of us. He just has this posture uh, that welcomes us in. And that's just the Gospels, all right? There's so many other places in the New Testament, too, where we see the, just the image of, like, this is the Father that we pray to. 1 Peter 5, 7. You know, Peter was one of Jesus' closest people. And so he, from Jesus, he learned the heart of the Father really, really well. And so he could go on to say this, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Like you can do some shady, nasty stuff to this guy, and guess what? He's just going to welcome you back in. You can feel anxious about whatever it is that's going on in your life. He wants to come. He wants you to hear it. That's the character of the Father. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weakness. For he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us 
when we need it most. Boldly, you know, the opposite of the Wizard of Oz, where it's ugh, like, I'm not sure if I can even go into his presence. It's just like, Dad, here I am. Like, I, I, I need to, I got to talk with you about something, you know? Like, that's the posture that the Father invites us to have with him. And then, I mean, we could go on and on and on, but listen to this one too. Romans 8, 15 through 16. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. You know, it's interesting. Uh, I was reading one of my commentaries, and there's this guy, Scott McKnight. He's kind of one of my heroes. Um, and I, I didn't have enough time to, like, comb through it all and see if this was true. But one of the things that he said there is that every time Jesus addressed God in prayer, he always referred to him as Abba, Father. Except for one time when we see, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so that's interesting because that term, Abba, was kind of like a child with their dad. Like when you have a good intimate relationship and there's just trust and your dad is good, your father's good, uh, that you call him Abba. You know, like it's, it's an intimate term that you don't just throw around with any other man in your life. Um, that's reserved for that relationship with that person. And so Jesus invites us to, as you get to know him and follow me, he gets to be your father too. That you can refer to him as Abba. That you're not outsiders to this, but that you are members of the family now. In good standing. You're his children. That kind of a father. And you know, I've gotten to experience this kind of personally. Uh, because when, when my brother and I were young, mom always had this, uh, this desire on her heart to adopt a child. And I remember when we were young and selfish, we were like, nah, no, no, no. Like, that's going to mean our allowance is going to be less. That means there's going to be fewer Christmas presents. And like, that's just where our minds were as kids. And so we fought that with them. But much later on in life, after we had all moved out of the house and gone on with our lives, uh, mom and dad had an opportunity uh, to take in these two girls, uh, Madison and Mackenzie Whitefeather, the two Native American girls. Uh, and, like, they took him in when they were 12. And, and mom and dad, like, they're up there in age a bit now. So it's just like, what are you guys doing? This is going to be a tough one for you. And it was, okay? There were some serious challenges along the way. And I felt a little bit defensive for them, too, sometimes. And, you know, like, uh, things didn't end up working out with Madison. Like, she kind of went her separate way. And, and there's still good, good blood there. Um, but, but Kenzie has really stuck with the family. Uh, and she's been like kind of off and on a little bit. Sometimes she's present, sometimes she's away. But you know the thing is, is that the Fredrickson household for her has always been home base. It's always the place that she knows that she's welcome and that she's loved. And we are so proud to have her there. And you know the thing is, is when you have a meal, when you have dinner with each other, uh, you don't just invite anybody to Thanksgiving, to Christmas, to your birthday party. But guess what? Kenzie gets to come to all of those. Because she's a member in good standing. She might be a white feather, but she's a Fredrickson too. And she gets to sit at the table with the rest of us. This is what God is saying to every single person out there. You get to be part of this too. You get to be a child. You even get to call me Abba. You're an insider to this thing. That's the father that we get to pray for. And as Sue said, we're so fortunate that we have a God that's like this. And so when we pray the Lord's Prayer and we get to that line where we say, Our Father in heaven, we can go mur, 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 through it. But think about what you're saying. It's this kind of Father. He's a Father who's like Jesus. That's incredible. We get to bring all of our stuff before him. Essentially, we're saying, our Father in heaven, we're saying, our all-powerful, almighty, Christ-like Father. That's who we're addressing. We pray to this good, Christ-like Father, this Jesus-like Father. This is who He is. He loves us. As it says in that Phil Wickham song, He welcomes us with open arms like this. And He wants us to just come running. In. And I, like, sometimes like when I'm praying to Him, Lord's Prayer, I just imagine just jumping into his lap and curling up there and him just like holding me because he wants that. 
He wants to hear what we have to say. He loves us. He's that kind of father. He's the kind of father that will go to literally the greatest lengths so that we can belong to his family. As Hannah prayed, we don't deserve it, his sacrifice, but he allowed his body to be broken and his blood to be poured out for us and make a new covenant with us so that we can sit with him and call him Abba, Father, and join him at the table because he knelt down with arms wide open for us in this world. And he invites us to do the same with all who are gathered at this table. And so during this time, as we uh, partake in communion, I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up. Um, but what we do is, if, if this Jesus thing is your thing, if you follow him, you don't even have to be good at it, like the golf, right? But if you're figuring it out, if you're fumbling your way through this and you're following Jesus, we welcome you to the table. There's going to be people who are sitting at the back, uh, standing at the back, and they've got the elements, the bread and the grape juice. You can go at some point during the final song, uh, and you can take the bread, the body of Christ. You can dip it in the juice, the blood of Christ, and consume it so that we, too, can be like Christ as we're nourished by him, his way of doing things, that kind of Heavenly Father. Let me pray for us. God, we thank you that you don't just leave us abandoned to ourselves to try to figure it out, to fumble through this life. Uh, Jesus, you even teach us how to pray. You even teach us how to address and who to address. You make it so clear to us uh, the character of the Heavenly Father. And so, Holy Spirit, I just ask that uh, if, if Father is a hard thing for people, anybody in this room, in this place, uh, that you would help them to understand the true nature and character that you're talking about. That you're good. You're good, you're good. And you will go to the greatest lengths to care for your children, even death, even suffering, even resurrection. So thank you for that, Lord. I pray uh, that as we address you, that we would feel the warmth, that we would feel the welcome, that we would rejoice in that, so that when we stand in your presence, it's a privilege, it's an honor, it's a joy. It's not drudgery. It's not just a religious thing that we're doing. Uh, it's life. Because you are a God that looks like Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you for all that you've done for us. And thank you that your great sacrifice allows us to sit with you at your table and call you Abba Father. Because without you, Lord, we can't. But you have. And so we humbly come before you and we give you thanks. And we offer up all of our lives.